All right. Thank you, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started up. Appreciate everybody taking your time to come here to uh, the August issues forum. We had a little break this summer and had a great, uh, great itinerary this past spring and early summer. And happy to kick off the school season and having these two gentlemen here today, Dr. Baron Davis and Dr. Frank Witherspoon, our local uh, district superintendents, and appreciate their time and everybody being here today to go over um, the monthly issues forum. We get to highlight. Uh, issues that are impacting the community and hear from leaders that are directing us through those issues. So thanks to everybody for being here. We'll allow time uh, during the program to allow for audience questions. So if you just raise your hand, I'll do my best to recognize you and uh, give you the opportunity to get up and ask questions and uh, try to keep your question limited to one. Um, so we have you know, opportunities for everybody else to, uh, to jump in. But uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Davis and Dr. Witherspoon. Appreciate y'all being here. And taking your time out of your uh, your busy schedules, particularly with uh, your staff coming back, Dr. Witherspoon just told me on August 9th. So thanks for your time. Um, before we get started, if y'all would take a little time to give uh, some background on on yourself and also the staff, number of employees, schools you're serving, um, a little bit about yourself, and uh, that'd be a great way to segue into our questions. So, Dr. Witherspoon, I'll start with you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Frank Witherspoon, superintendent of the school district one. Been here in the district um, for about seven or eight years. And, uh, have experience in, in urban, suburban, and rural. Kind of follow that traditional uh, leadership route: classrooms, teaching, well man breakfast, uh, administration at school level central office and so forth. So it's been a good opportunity. Uh, and, and when you know you started education, uh, you move forward, you're always a teacher. You're always thinking about uh, what goes in the on in that classroom and that, like, how do you make the lives of students better? And it just matriculate up, if you will, uh, in a competitive classroom, the classroom is to your classroom, you've got 20, your, your personal, your classroom, you've got that school, and you work through individuals, you work through your teachers, you work through your administrators, you work through community partners, you work through others to, to influence and, and make our students better. Um, certainly, uh, it's been a privilege to, to serve in Mission One. Uh, one of the most diverse uh, districts in, in the state of South Carolina, not the largest, not the smallest, uh, but in terms of poverty index and, and, and it's, it's, it's the thing, it's what we have, uh, and, and some of those other uh, things that we, we deal with, even uh, with those things, we try to influence and make sure our students' experience is better on the other end. Last couple of years, we've seen the highest graduation rate uh, that the district has had. We've seen the lowest. There we go. <laughs> we've seen the. Do I need to start again? No. <laughs> we've seen the highest graduation rate that, that we've had. We've seen the lowest dropout rate um, in the district's history. Uh, we've had an opportunity to um, not only improve student outcomes, but what we like to talk about in terms of options and opportunities for young people, uh, whether that's having 16 of the 16 career pathways for students to take advantage of, magnet programs, uh, other experiences and opportunities for our students, again, so that they're better because of their experience um, with us. Uh, so very proud of that. <clears throat> Proud of our, 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 our staff, uh, the community, we have some community partners that are certainly here in the room uh, this morning. Uh, so again, it, it's about making sure that our students are better because of their experiences uh, in our district. Thank you. Dr. Davis, uh, same question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Baron Davis. I have the honor and privilege to serve in the superintendent of Richmond School District 2. Um, I have served as superintendent since 2017. I spent one year, 2016 to 2017, serving as superintendent-elect, which gave me an opportunity to kind of learn 
uh, as uh, kind of an uh, on-the-job um, learning opportunity with my predecessor, uh, Dr. Debbie Hamm. I am a native of Columbia, South Carolina. I grew up right here, downtown Columbia. And this is my home. I've never lived anywhere else, never had another residence. This is my home city. I grew up right in Alabama Court, Saxon Home, which was right down the street, or used to be right down the street. Um, and so I am committed and dedicated to this city and it's been a part of, of the city, not as a, just as a youth and participating in many of the programs that the city has offered and also as a student. Graduated from, proud graduate of C.A. Johnson High School, class of 1990. Shouldn't have to tell you that I said, should have to say proud graduate because if you know anything about this city, and you know about the history of C.A. Johnson High School, you understand why most individuals who during my era would say proud graduate of C.A. Johnson High School. I've had the fortune now to work in three different school settings, rural, urban, and suburban. Served as a principal in uh, Orangeburg Consolidated School District 4. Served as a principal at Alcorn Middle School for four years, as well as a principal at Spring Valley High School, uh, which I got my start in education in Richmond School District 2 at Spring Valley High School back in 1999. Had an opportunity to work as a school counselor, uh, school administrator, assistant administrator, assistant principal, principal, um, um, worked as a uh, assistant superintendent now as superintendent. Um, it's very clear uh, what my purpose is and what God's purpose is for my life as it relates to uh, giving me an opportunity and a platform to serve as a school uh, administrator. My role and responsibility is to make sure that all the students under my care have a premier educational experience. And I do that by insisting and working to dismantle barriers that uh, stand in the way of giving students equitable opportunities here in this district, in my district and in this community as well as state and national. And so we focus on things in our school district that allow our students to be able to do those things. Um, one of the first school districts, not the first school district in the state to pass an equity policy that allows us to do this work. Uh, we've been concentrating and focused on uh, recruiting men of color to the classrooms and, and being really unapologetic about those things. We've been great stewards of the money in our school district, ensuring that our kids have the resources that they need, but at the same time being responsible to our community as well. Um, we have about 4,000 employees in Richmond School District, 240 schools that we operate with the fifth largest school district in the state. Um, the largest school district that is not countywide in the state of South Carolina. Now, all the school districts that are bigger than us are all countywide school districts. And so, um, like I said, we have 40, we have about 28,000 plus students in our school district. That number fluctuates, so I never try to be down to the exact number of students, um, but it fluctuates between uh, 28,000, uh, 28,500 so students pre K and 12th grade. We offer about 38 different distinct magnet programs in Richmond School District 2. We actually all have the second largest number of certified magnet programs in the country, only second to Miami-Dade um, County School District, which is a massive school district, uh, if you know anything about that school system. So we're proud to be able to offer those options. We say we're a district of choice, where every school is an excellent choice. And so we try to have programs that are specific um, um, to the needs of the students within that community, but give them the opportunity, give parents and students the opportunity to select schools that they think best align with their students' gifts and talents, which is part of our mission and our vision of our school district. So in our mission statement, we simply want to partner with our community to ensure that our students are global citizens of tomorrow, citizens who are prepared to lead and excel in their chosen pathways, and we have a myriad of, of uh, opportunities and uh, pathways that allow them to do so. Great, thank you. And I'll write on Dr. Davis because I was very impressed with this and he didn't tell you this in his background. He's also a very good parent. Uh, he and I were talking before this started. He's got a daughter that's starting architectural school at Mississippi State and has another one just graduated early from honor school at USC. Is going to medical school and working three jobs a summer. So he's done a good job on the home front taking care of this family. Very impressed. So let's jump right in, guys. Um, the first question is, I guess, related to the biggest issue y'all faced the last two years with COVID, with COVID in the classroom. Now that you're back 100%, um, are there specific guidelines you're going to try to follow and adapt as the year goes on? Dr. Witherspoon, please start. If you want. First, I would like to thank, uh, I'd like to thank um, certainly our staff, our students, parents, and community as we dealt with COVID the last few years. 
uh, and, and kind of learning as we go and, 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 and what we have to do. So I appreciate that. We took a very uh, cautious route. I think that served us well in terms of lower transmission, lower uh, numbers of, of um, students and, and staff with COVID and, and quarantine and so forth. But as we move forward, um, have a meeting with, with, with our, our nurse coordinator and so forth, looking at, at DHAC and what they are proposing uh, moving forward uh, and, and transitioning to this endemic phase of, 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 of COVID versus pandemic. And um, looking at it from the, from the outbreak, kind of how we deal with flu and some other things versus um, the, the COVID protocols in totality uh, that we had in the past. So we will be cleaning that up uh, this week, communicating with our, our principals and then cascading that out to parents and, uh, and family. We're trying to get our volunteers back in and, and get back to some sense of, of, of normalcy, uh, uh, if you will, uh, as we move forward. So we'll continue to do that, but uh, approaching this a little differently uh, moving forward again uh, with those protocols, working with uh, health department, I, I would like to add, we have a very good relationship with Prisma Health uh, throughout the, 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 the pandemic and certainly um, uh, DHEC and, and, and others. But we're looking at, uh, again, some more of a sense of normalcy as we move forward and looking at those numbers, you know, CDC and DHEC rather have the, the numbers with regard to if it's flu or something else, how many and, and what do you do and, and, and all of that. So we'll be looking at it from that phase uh, as we move forward. Uh, just to get a good what uh, Dr. Wilson just shared, I, I think it's important to understand that the guidelines from DHEC has just really been released. Um, and so we're in a process, all school districts around the state are really in the process of looking at the guidelines. Um, that have been shared by DHEC. I don't see any um, substantial changes in the forecast from where we ended the school, how we ended the school last year. So I don't see us going through if parents or community members having to worry about virtual or hybrid or phasing in and things like that. We'll be in school 100% um, face-to-face. Um, -face. Um, so many of those options that we had in place are um, have slowly kind of expired. Um, there will still be opportunities and offerings for dual and um, for, for dual modality if and when that's the need. One of the things that COVID is, um, even though the, the virus has transitioned to this end, as endemic type of a uh, phase, the results uh, are still there. We still have people who are going to be quarantined. Uh, we still have um, teacher shortage issues or employee shortage issues as a result of that, which requires us to still be very creative and innovative in how we offer educational experiences for our students. So some of those uh, modalities will still be a part of that. that. As far as the safety and security side of it, um, I think people can continue to expect to see thorough cleanings and high touches. There'll still be a lot of emphasis on um, cleaning the facility, particularly those high point, those high um, surface and touch points within our buildings. We'll use electromagnetic, uh, those electro um, sprayers uh, electrostatic uh, sprayers in our schools, particularly when we, if we have a cohort um, that 20% uh, or more of the students within a particular classroom um, that have uh, has contracted uh, the COVID uh, virus, COVID-19 virus. You know, if a student uh, and an individual has tested positive on the return back to school in those six to 10 days to work with school, the expectation would be that they wear a mask. That's still part of the guidelines from DA. Um, and it will be up to the other individuals if they choose to wear a mask or not, it would not be mandatory unless you tested positive and you're returning back to work. And I think that's something we still see common in, in, in the workplace. A couple other steps that we may take, we're taking now, we're looking at uh, if, if we're in a vehicle, for example, we transport someone in a vehicle, two or more people, we're highly, um, <clears throat> we're highly encouraging them to wear a mask when they're in close quarters like that in the transportation of, of a vehicle. So, if we have staff, for example, um, on our um, and our maintenance staff or something like that, and they're sharing a vehicle, um, we would encourage that, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be mandatory. Um, and then continuously look continually looking at the DHEC guidelines 
and modifying and making any adjustments. I think the most important part of that is going to be the early communication to individuals um, within the community and within our school setting and let them know uh, what the guidelines are, what the, if there are going to be any um, major changes uh, and giving them uh, that information uh, uh, as early as possible. Great. Sitting with you, Dr. Davis, um, can you tell us about how you were able to track the progress of your students during the pandemic and also are there systems in place for certain students that, you know, they fell behind the learning curve due to virtual learning and not adapting well to that? Yeah, so the first thing that we, you know, we, 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 we wanted to push back on a little bit with this idea of this learning curve that students fell behind. It really is kind of standardized this idea of learning. What we, what we focused on in our school district, and I think many school districts as well as in Richland One and several, we focus on the loss of instructional time. That's what our students lost. COVID came in, we weren't in school, March hit, we left school. There was a loss of direct instructional time. All the models, all the research tells us that 180 days of instruction should gain you one year academic growth. One year academic growth after 180 days of instruction. So when we lost that direct instruction, we lost the opportunity to gain that one year academic growth. So some of the things we put in place, of course, was extended, extended day opportunities in our schools. Um, all schools were required to think to do week um, right after um, we received the first round of, 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 of funds. But we had to focus on learning. We had to um, evaluate our students. We had to analyze the data. And we had to, I think, we put them in a position to, to be successful. So we all focused on that. Um, we did SOAR, which was our um, summer program, a very intensive summer program for elementary, middle, and high school students. And so one of the ways we track our students' pro progress is we looked at um, throughout the year, they took their, um, their um, interval benchmarks. And in their benchmarks assessment, we saw how they were progressing on grade level for a specific standard. Um, that's one of the benefits of having benchmarks assessments is allow us to look at it in a complete fourth grade, a complete fifth grade, and we can say on indicators of learning X, this percentage of our students are on target. And when we don't, when we see where we have a, a significant number of students that are not progressing on grade level or something like that in, in, in an area, you can deploy those resources. But based on the preliminary data, looking at our so our preliminary data, um, the source programs the extended learning opportunities that we offer our students and uh, and just the fact that the uh, hats off to our teachers instructional aides and everybody that pitched in substitutes who helped cover classes um, because last year was not a normal school year we still had a lot of people out because of COVID, uh, because of COVID when they were quarantining we still have teachers and students missing you know five to ten days uh, depending on what the, when when they contracted COVID, and so we had students who will return to school um, from being a close contact, and then they get COVID, and then they're out again. So students were missing a lot of time, as well as the teachers were missing a lot of time. So we're not quite um, caught up with um, the loss of instructional time, but I think we're making great progress with that, and I think the data will 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 speak to that. Great, thank you, Dr. Witherspoon. Anything you'd like to add? To that? Similar, and, and as Dr. Davis said, uh, a lot of districts have some of the same strategies uh, in which to, to, to um, make up for that, that, that learning loss, that, instruction, that direct instructional loss. Uh, I would also like to emphasize that use of, of formative assessments, uh, those short cycle assessments to uh, determine uh, what students have learned, what, that, what they might have missed, and how, uh, how our teachers and staff could, could use that time a little more effectively if they knew certain concepts and certain things, okay, we could focus on something else depending on uh, the student and, and where they where they are. So really hone in on that, that information and how we use that, how that fit into uh, the, how that fit into the summer programs uh, uh, that we have and how that led into things that we did last school year and this summer and then moving forward, uh, again, trying to maximize that time uh, that we have. And there's research and data that, that, that suggests, you know, the, that, that, that learning loss, that loss of instructional time, if you will, that direct instruction can be gained, but it's, it's going to be gained, if you will, uh, but that is going to take time. But we'll continue to use those resources, continue to, to, to focus in on, on the needs of students and the needs of staff. We were having some conversation before this meeting started 
We're seeing an uptick in cases right now. Uh, and, and we hope uh, with, with this new variant, uh, and, and, and thankfully it, it's not as severe uh, and so forth, but the hospitalizations are ticking up. Uh, and the end cases um, are, are, are ticking up and, and, and we, uh, we don't have everyone back yet, uh, but as Dr. Davis said, uh, we'll have those contingencies in place uh, and, and deal with that, but we know that's going to be a piece. We're going to be open and all those things, uh, but there are some things that we have to do, but uh, uh, again, maximizing uh, those formative assessment uh, data and information so that so that we can get our students ready. Great. Thank you. We're going to next jump into budgets, and after this section, we'll allow uh, time for uh, audience questions, so uh, hang on to those for a second. Uh, can you talk about, we'll start back with you, Dr. Witherspoon. Can you talk about what, what, what goes into your budget process, um, you know, time, uh, detail, uh, how you allocate um, for future years? Sure. Uh, just general overview, that'd be great. Well, believe it or not, in, in, a, in a school system, you're always in somewhere in the budget process, 12 months out of the year. Uh, and you've been working on the budget, in in the budget, preparing for the next year, assessing where are you, uh, finishing up audits, all of those types of things. So you're always somewhere in the budget, <clears throat> excuse me, somewhere in the budget cycle. Um, uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, our board approved uh, budget 358 million uh, plus. That's just in general fund. Uh, that's that's not. Um, special revenue, federal dollars, enterprise funds, uh, so forth and so on. Uh, so uh, what, what we do, and we, we started this a number of, of, of years ago, um, sit down, first of all, what are the needs? What is it we need to do? Then, you know, of course, what is it you have to do? Do we have to pay the light bill? Do we have to pay gas? Do we got to get diesel fuel? All those things. Uh, you got to purchase the bread, milk, and all of those things, the student nutrition, and so so those things that that you know have to. You also have to uh, project out uh, what's going on with inflation. Uh, will the diesel fuel cost the same moving forward as it did last year, uh, and so forth and so on. So those things you you kind of have to continue to to look at day to day, month to month semester to semester, year in, year out. And then those, those needs, uh, if you will. And part of that is, uh, and we, we, we all do this in terms of budget cycle, we have those meetings uh, with staff, with teachers, with everyone. And, okay, what are those things we want to take a look at? What are, what are those things we want to do? We were able this year, for example, to put some things back into our budget uh, that, uh, we pulled out going back to 2008, 2009 with the economic downturn, uh, such as um, uh, letting uh, teachers accrue more days past the 90 uh, and, 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 and paying those out, uh, making some adjustments to the salary schedule. Um, one of the things that happened with Dr. Davis and, and, and I know the middle of the superintendents across the district, you know, and we'll, we'll uh, increase. Uh, teacher salary or, or some supplement or what have you, and then it was a competitive market. You'll do the same. Then we've got to come back and say, oh, and then somebody else will do the same. Uh, we know Greenville, for example, um, went to 44, 40, 000, 44, 45,000 uh, starting salary. Uh, uh, Ori or um, uh, one of the districts down in Low Country did the same thing. That's something we want to look at. But we were able to do some things Differently, and as you all know, in the, in the budget process, whether it's at home, whether that's in your your your, your work, uh, it's a give and take. What are those priorities? What are those things you have to do, want to do, need to do, uh, and and where that's going to come from, uh, and and how you're going to make that work? There was a different funding uh, formula from the state this year. Uh, that, that impacted uh, school districts. Some gained, some didn't. Some gained more than others. Uh, and so forth. So you have to balance all of those things. And as Dr. Davis said, we, we all strive to be good stewards of taxpayers' dollars. 
and how we can manage uh, those things again that we need to do, must do, have to do, uh, and still be good stewards and still accomplish our full mission uh, and, and vision with, with our students. So uh, we continue to do that. Uh, and, and what we do too, and last, last thing on this is, again, we look at those needs and then we look at now how do all these funding streams support the need versus we've got this pot, what are we gonna do with this pot? We've got this pot, what are we gonna do? But then you get a little disjointed. But if you look at those needs and things that, that you, you, you wanna do in terms of good for the organization, then how do those funds and those various rules, regulations, provisos, all of those things uh, impact um, um, what we do. So if we always stay in a constant state of, of, of budget, um, evaluating during the year, are things working? Do you need to tweak, change, regroup, do more of this, less of that, and so forth. So it's a continuous thing, but we try to support, not we try, we balance uh, uh, the budget and we look at how that fits the needs of the district. Okay, Dr. Davis. Well, uh, Megan, before I, I answer the budget question, you just permit me one quick second to also add that I have a third goal. I'm sorry. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I have all girls, so if you know anything about that, um, I need to make sure that she is recognized as well. Um, and so, so just in case something's being taped and videoed or recorded. <laughs> and, and it's so right exactly, now, right? Sure. I was mentioning yeah. that I have two daughters. I have three daughters, and, and she's a junior. She's a rising junior at Spring Valley High School. So um, I didn't want to leave her out. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, if, if, if you know anything about which all of you do, um, running companies, organizations, your, your primary expense is employees, bottom line. And 88 to 90% of school district budgets goes to employees. That, that's the vast majority. So whatever you think the number is or what the budget is, understand that 88 to probably 90% of that budget is allocated to employees. Now, if the, what schools are challenged with it is in these times are things where we are we, we want lower class sizes. So if you want small class sizes, it requires more teachers. And the more teachers you have, the more your expenses are going to be when it comes to the employee side. So we have about 10 to 12 percent of the general fund budget remaining to do some of the other things that we need to do. The programs, the experiences that we offer our students, the supplies, and so on and so forth. Um, that's an important piece of really budgeting those things and allocating for those things. So when you talk about projections uh, and how do we allocate for and anticipate the projections, well, every year we look at whether or not, you know, in our school district, our growth projections and what our needs are going to be for the following year. That can be contractual expenses. If you have contractual obligations to meet, then there are going to be costs that are going to be associated, as you all know, as business folk. You're going to increase your expenses and your costs to do business for us to do business with you. So, for example, in Richmond School District 2, we contract out services for um, for custodial. We contract services for food, um, for our food vendor, our food services, as well as for our, main, for our, um, our grounds keeper. When those expenses increase, they are passed on, they're passed on to the district. Um, so we have to allocate for those things. And then there's also things that come from the state. Um, that are also either either increased or decreased or rolled up into particular line items and, and things of that nature. But the vast majority of our money is allocated to our is to our staff. And, and I just want to say that because this is this normal of oftentimes associated with school districts and organizations of this mismanagement of money. If if you don't believe it, then, then do the, just simply do the research and find that roughly eighty eight to ninety percent of the school district's budget goes to its employees. In the school, in your school district. Now, as Craig said, we're in a very competitive market, and so we are looking to increase our employee pay. We have employees in our school district, particularly this year, who are making you know ten to twelve dollars an hour. You know, folk at my daughter Chick Fil A was making fifteen an hour when she this summer. We're better wage than some employees. We have to address that. That's a real issue that we have to address. One of the ways that we are able to, to increase our revenue is through taxes. 
I mean, I know that's the real question that we kind of dance around. I felt like that was if the real question is how do we generate revenue? We generate revenue through taxes. We're not fiscally autonomous in Richmond School District too. So we have to go to a county council and ask for an increase in taxes. The vast majority of the increase in taxes um, when we ask for that goes to businesses. It doesn't go to homeowners. Almost don't pay operating expenses for, to run school districts. We need to dispel that because Act 388 took that away from, took that responsibility and burden off of homeowners and shipped that burden on to you all, the business leaders and the business, the business owners in the state. And that's really a unique uh, funding formula in this country. Most school districts in this country don't do not have a funding formula where residents don't pay taxes, operating expenses to run to operate schools, where your tax expenses come in as on the debt service side. So when we have to incur debt, you then pay taxes on that, and that's what you see. But not for when we add an additional teacher, that's an operating expense. That expense comes on the business end. So we do at some point need to really address the Act 388 issue if we really want to try to get that under control. As far as our process, um, it's just, it's similar around the state and probably around the nation. There's no, we don't do anything innovative uh, and, and when it comes to the process of that. We send out surveys to our staff and ask them what their priorities are, what are the things you need because they're the ones doing the work. We need to know what are some of the additional supports you need in your school? What are some things you would like to see us do with this budget? The board, our school board also um, puts in their budget priorities, what are their focus? So let's say the board's budget priority, because they are elected by the members of their community, the members of the community want to keep class sizes low. So that means you have to look at your FTEs because that's a priority. You don't wanna go from one to 17 to one to 23. So in order to keep class sizes low, if enrollment goes up, you have to add more teachers. That's a budget challenge that you have to do that. And you're projecting that out several years. So once you get that information back in, you give your public input. And in our district, we do three public inputs for the budget. The public has three opportunities to come before us to share with us what they will want to hear. And that's in addition, in addition to sending some sur sending surveys out as well. But our public has three opportunities. I think we're only required by law to do one. But we do three to give everybody an opportunity to share with us directly, personally, what they would like to see in the budget. Then we take all of those considerations and we then we develop the budget based on our needs. We then present that budget back to the board, back to the community, and then we take a vote, we do two votes to approve the budget for our school district. And if it requires that we ask for a tax increase, uh, a millage increase, then we are, we're, we're, we're required to then take that request to county council uh, to get that request, to get that millage increase uh, approved. And um, if we get it, we add that to the budget. The, the benefit of that increase uh, is that's recurring revenue. Once you get that additional increase from taxes, then you will have that money every year. When you look at sometimes special revenue funds in particular, I know there was a lot of talk about CARES money, but we have to remember CARES money for, you, for, for all of us who understand this is one-time money, right? It's over a course of years, but if you start building in positions with CARES money, when the money runs out, I gotta get the money from somewhere. So the money is gonna come from somewhere. The only way I can increase revenue is to reduce expenses, the vast majority of my expenses come, our expenses come from employees. So then or we have to produce services. And that 10% is not going to make that big of a difference in the operation of our schools and keeping you accustomed to the high quality education experience that you expect and our students deserve. Thank you. And I'd like to compliment both of y'all. Usually I won't name our last speakers. We had some speakers come in and don't look at our questions beforehand. Y'all did, so y'all just answered my next two questions on this. So <laughs> thank you for being prepared and going through all that. Um, we're gonna take a, uh, um, I'm gonna let Dr. Witherspoon uh, add on and I'd just like for you to discuss, and, and after that break, we're gonna ask questions from the crowd, but um, Dr. Uh, Davis touched on, what were you intending to do with some of your increased revenue? Was it more recurring for, for salary increases or new jobs or what was, you know, 
what you proposed in the milk increase this year, what did you have earmarked for that? First, let me do this. I do want to, I think it's a good segment. I do want to recognize, I think I have two board members here. Uh, Mr. Jamie Devine, uh, who's also president of the South Thanks. Carolina uh, State Board Association. And then we have Mr. Uh, Robert Dominic is here as well. So I want to recognize those two. I think. Um, Richmond One did not ask uh, for a millage increase uh, this past year. Uh, but I, but I, I certainly echo Dr. Davis' um, uh, uh, comments on that process and how that works. Uh, because Again, whether that's maintaining uh, lower uh, class sizes or, or looking at salary and, and, and so forth, uh, and, and I've had this conversation with folks, given that 10% that he, that he talked about, you, you can't cut your way to meeting those needs in the future. Yeah, uh, higher staff, you increase salaries, and so forth. Um, uh, there's a there's a mandatory step increase that has to happen uh, with all of those individuals, um, and oftentimes a lot of districts also will look locally at, at what could be done uh, from a competitive standpoint uh, beyond that mandatory step increase. Uh, for example, with us, with that step increase, we also looked at. Um, 1500 for teachers, uh, 1000 for for non teachers. That was in, in addition to again that competitiveness. And but that is the gift that keeps on giving uh, because next school year you've got to do the same. Uh, then a few years ago, uh, there was an increase uh, to retirement and so forth, some that the, the employer employee picked up, but the vast majority of that increase was on the employer, on the school district. So there was an increase there uh, and, and so forth. So we, we all have to keep that in mind, you know, as we as we move forward. And, and uh, that becomes a challenge year, year after year. Uh, but that is a, uh, that, that, that personnel cost, that, that uh, 88 to, to, to 90%, uh, that's a cost that continues to increase, even if all of those other things stayed flat, if you will. The fuel stayed flat, the electricity stayed flat, all of those things, those costs uh, 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 do increase. So uh, very good points, and we do have to keep that in mind. Great, thank you. All right, I'm going to take two questions from the audience. Ron, please. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Ron Harvey. My question is, um, we just going to do it, I apologize earlier. School safety or safety in general that's on the rise as we've seen. What, what do you need from parents? What can we expect from school as we reopen school? And we're at a, a horrible place right now in society with school safety. And I have a daughter that's getting into high school and we don't feel safe whether it's a school or a church or a mall. Safety is an issue. What, what, should, what do we need to pay attention to to help you? But what can we expect from this new right here? Well, I, I want to say thank you, um, one, for having us is students in public schools in the South Carolina, particularly in Richmond School District too, so I'll say that. But, and I also want to just simply thank you for acknowledging the fact that safety is everybody's responsibility. Oftentimes we see in the media, the focus is just on schools. Like, and it's because I, and I understand that, but I'm just as worried, um, as I have shared earlier, I've, I've had three daughters go through the school systems in my school district and Got one that has 10 schools every day. My spouse is employed in a school in the district. So safety is always a concern. It's not I mean, my, my own safety um, in, in, a, in school districts. Um, but also when they go to a party or they go to the mall, um, incidents happen. Uh, and so I'm concerned about just in general, the mindset around safety. Um, what you can expect from schools, I think um, one, is a, a re-emphasis on uh, our procedures. We gotta make sure that we follow the procedures when it, that we already have in place as it relates to safety. That means you may be inconvenient you know, for parents that you won't be able to, the, the, the friendly teacher that lets you in the side door because you're the, the, the mom that helps out. So you gotta go to the front desk and check in. 
Everybody's got to go to the front desk and check in. Um, we got to in, in, inspect what we expect. No propping open the doors because there are two threats. They're the external threats and the internal threats. The external threats, schools have done an, an outstanding job with vestibules and, and secure entryways and things like that to deal with that. It's the internal threats that's the issue, particularly at the middle and the high schools where students, and unfortunately even in elementary schools where students may bring things into the schools that they are not supposed to bring into the schools that create a safety, that breaks down the safety. So parents have to be parents and be vigilant at home. Um, don't be their student's um, best friend. Check their book bags. Ask them questions. Go in their rooms. Um, access to their phones, text messages, emails, all those things, particularly once you see a sign that there could be a concern or an issue, to really have that hard conversation with your students about, about that. Um, if you have weapons, if there are weapons at home, make sure that the weapons are secure. That you know that that they your students can't access them if they are uh, if they're uh, visiting friends friends homes. Make sure that you have those hard conversations with the, those friends and their families about those types of things um, uh, about whether or not there are weapons in homes. Um, you will see in schools again uh, and as far as the internal threats. You know we both deployed uh, the randomization of the use of metal detectors. Um, and there's data and research on both sides of that coin. Um, we can, we feel a certain way, and then the data plays out and tells us a certain thing too. And we want to be data informed in our school district, not data driven. Um, but I, I've seen articles, and there are articles out there that says it gives a false sense of of security. Um, and there's, there's a, there was a big a big study done in in LA Unified school district, I think it was LA Unified or Compton Unified, I want to say LA Unified school district, right after the Martin Douglas uh, Stoneman uh, incident in Parkland, where this massive school system introduced metal detectors. Um, and in that time period, they found five weapons um, from the metal detectors, but the vast majority of weapons they found was because someone told in that school. So we can't Replace metal detectors can't replace relationships. So we can't get too focused on, it's not saying that you don't do those things, because I think the community at this point expects it. And you're, all, you're, all, you're in a situation where you have to have some sort of deterrent in schools at this point, but it can't be a replacement to relationships that adults, administrators, parents, we all working together, unified for the safety of our students. We cannot be divided on that. We cannot take positions and have uh, our, our own personal agendas when it comes to safety. We need to work together to make sure that our schools are safe. So if you know something, let us know. If we know something, to let you know. That's the one thing we have to be unified around is ensuring that our schools are safe and secure, not just for our students, but for our communities. For our teachers, I want my teachers to feel safe and secure when they're in the building, as well as I want my students to feel safe and secure. And I want a parent to feel safe and secure when they're in the building, as well as I have to who comes to a building to feel safe and secure within the district. Everybody should feel safe and secure in the schools and in our school buildings and in our communities. So it's going to take all of our parts in doing that. And it'll be great if we start this year off. We have no debates about how we keep our schools safe, and we always work to the work in the best interest of our students to ensure that they have that type of experience while they're at school. Dr. Whitaker, then we'll about that. Um, ditto um, to, to what Dr. Whitaker <laughs> <Davis> said. <laughs> I want to add safety to your point is, is certainly those things. And it's unfortunate we, we you know, bulk of the conversation discussion is the hard meat of, of things. You know, I won't, won't venture too far into that. Uh, but the other side of, of this coin in terms of safety, and, and I've always been a big uh, Abraham Maslow fan uh, in, in, in terms of um, those safety and security needs. The relationship piece that we've talked about, we've got to have, but we also have to have those relationships with all of our students through advisors, uh, through mentorships, uh, 
through students knowing that if they're going through something, there is a there's a caring adult somewhere uh, within the, the, the footprint of that building, whether it's the custodian, whether it's the, the counselor or the IA or the SRO, if you will, that they can go to and, and not only say, hey, I'm going through something, but hey, you might want to go check on someone else. A lot of those you know, weapons and, 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 and threats internal uh, that, that were alluded to um, because the SRO or some adult was in there that students invited. Uh, so we, 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 we look at, at, at that whole safety piece in a, in a comprehensive mindset as well. Uh, and, and, and where students are mindset wise, and, and let's be clear, we, we have social workers, we have mental health professionals and all of that. But there's simply not enough out there. They're not coming through school. They're not. Uh, but you have to look at all of those pieces in terms of being comprehensive and how you deal with uh, the trauma, how you deal with students and, and, and staff for that matter. Uh, and, and so we have to look at those pieces in addition to uh, those other things that we certainly have to be vigilant uh, with on a day in and day out. Another question from the audience. Uh, good morning. Um, let's have to not let the talk, talk, talk about the instructional loss of students. Can you give us an example? You talked about um, the informative assessment. Can you kind of give us an example of informative assessment? I mean, when you find deficits, what do you do and how does it impact and has it impacted the budget? So you have the, those. those you have formative assessments, and then you have summative assessments. Summative assessments, that's the end of the year. You, you, whatever has occurred all during the year, you take the SC pass, SC ready in the course. I, I the examples of okay, but you know, AP tests, all of those, it's at the end, summation, summative. Then you have those formative, and that's the, the, the Summative assessments is, is assessments of learning, if you will. You were exposed to curriculum throughout the year, whatever kind of way. Now we're going to assess that. How'd you do? Then you have on the other side assessment for learning. Taught this, and in a short period of time, and that can be relative. Did the students get it? And if they got it, fine, you move on. But if half the room got it, half the room didn't, you got to do something different. And at the same time, you got pacing guides and these standards and things you got to cover to the end of the year because that big test at the end of the year is coming. But when you assess formatively, okay, how they do, I told you, you went on. Uh, uh, on insects or, or what happened? <clears throat> did they get it? And what aspect of that unit did they get or not get? So then the teacher has to, and the school has to look at that data and information and says, oh, okay, this aspect, we gotta reteach this. Now, how does that occur? Does it occur during the day? Is that small group? Is it, is it uh, Saturday? Uh, is it, is it, in between the, the winter break, so forth and so on. Because a, a, a lot, oftentimes the learning build, scaffolds, it builds on each other. You, know, you learn this and you take that information and you build upon that. So if some of those building blocks aren't there, that's gonna cause some issues later on. So when we talk about those formative assessments, short cycle assessment, and in terms of did they get it? what do we need to do to make sure and then by the same token those students that did get it they don't need a repeat of everything again so that's what makes teaching tough that's what makes education tough um, so that's what I mean by if they got it fine you move on but if they didn't how do you reteach regroup present it in a different way 
Uh, we all have these these uh, you know digital resources that will put the computer on students on a computer and 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 the, the programs are pretty good because they're somewhat intuitive. If you got it, then, then the next question is a little harder. If you didn't get it, then it it, it dials it down a little bit and, and so forth. And some, you know, algorithms, all that stuff built in. Uh, but that's that formative piece. And then that tells you, you know, by kid, by class, by grade level, and so forth and so on, you, you put together a plan of, of, of how to how to, to fill in those gaps and, and move the individual student, of course, forward, but also uh, those, those larger groups as well. So that, that becomes the... Uh, the challenge and again uh, COVID and not having that direct instruction that exacerbates you, you know we all have different learning styles and, you know I know we can't get along but that's the, the, the rub and what you've got to assess and how to how to best fill in those needs. Well, I, I can say okay. for, the, for the most part even I think for for both of us one of the benefits of the CARES money was that we used that the revenue from the CARES funding for a lot of this work. So it really didn't have a, a tremendous impact on your general fund, but um, unless you use this money to, for a staff, um, because again, it's one-time money. So some of the things we were able to do as a result of that was like this, this, our summer program and our extended day program. We're paying teachers to teach in the summer to teach all schools it's not summer school this is every kid has access to be able to come to uh a summer enrichment program we're providing transportation we're providing meals we're providing tutoring throughout the year we're using cares money to be able to allow us to do that but the benefit of that is that there were students who typically wouldn't have access to tutoring now we are able to afford to pay for tutoring for all of those students particularly those that are furthest behind so when you're talking about the loss of learning or the loss of instructional, the loss of instructional time, we have to remember that every student is not on the same plane, on the same plane of the same plane. There are some students who come to third grade, fourth grade, already two grade levels behind, right? Or come to kindergarten, not ready for kindergarten, or in second grade on a kindergarten level. This, these enrichment programs that we're now able to put in place, the tutor we're able to provide, the uh, access to the digital platforms that we're able to provide, the access to one-to-one -one technology that some school districts were now able to Im uh, implement in their schools and then out to all students. Um, those, are, those are the types of things we're able to do with the funding from CARES that didn't put it, didn't have an impact on the general fund money that we get um, each and every year. Now, what's going to happen is, when you talk about budgets, what's going to happen is at the end of the uh, allocation of the CARES funds, where are we going to be? We're going to have to assess where we are and what we need. And so will we need additional staff to continue what we've done to make up for the loss of instructional time over that, over that time period? And now those students who benefited from CARES as a, as a using it as a more like an equity vehicle, now that the students who come from those most impoverished communities now, they may lose access to that, those resources because they're not in the general fund. And you, so you got to start slowly building that into the general fund to keep that level of educational experience in place. If not, it's all gonna be taken away at one time, or you're gonna to have to cut staff, or you're gonna to have to cut some other programming to keep that level of that level. So there's gonna be parents now of all, for example, their parents of all economic uh, ranges whose students participate in our summer program. Whether the student is the most advanced student, one of the most advanced students, to one of the most uh, deficient academically students at this time. Whether they are students um, who, uh, who, who struggle with reading or who's reading on grade level. Everyone's participating in because we're building that capacity for uh, that, their, that capacity for the next school year. But at some point, that money is going to expire. And you won't see these free summer programs if districts can't roll that expense into their general fund because we're paying for it through our, our CARES money right now. Um, so when we're looking at those assessments, 
um, and we're assessing our students whether it's informally, formally, summative, or, uh, or, 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 um, or, or not, we're able to see what their, their areas of deficiency, their areas of weaknesses are, and then we're now able to deploy additional uh, support, either through technology, um, either through curriculum, the purchasing of curriculums, uh, special curriculum, um, particularly anything that's one-time money that you can just like purchase it now, you use that, that special revenue, that's that special revenue account to do that type of stuff. Um, whether it's through additional support staff. Um, and, and, and if you're able, based off of the way they're performing, the idea is to try to get them back to, uh, get them on grade level before this money, before the money runs out. That's, that's, that's the goal. And so that's why you see all these extended learning opportunities and summer opportunities for our students. and access to tutoring and things. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna give any uh, vendor a free plug, so I'm trying not to name anybody. <laughs> They'll say they give us a discount. <laughs> so I'm not trying to name anybody. So, but um, but that, that's what we, that's how we're assessing them. That's what we're doing. Thank you. Um, I've got several more questions, but if there's more from the audience, I appreciate there being such a good turnout today. We've got about five minutes left, so I want to defer if there was any. Yeah. I just want to recognize another uh, one of our board members, um, Ms. Ann Bishop, Dr. Ann Bishop. Thank you, Dr. Bishop, for being here. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I've got uh, two students in School District 1 and a uh, licensed educator, so appreciate the challenges that y'all do and the work you do every day. Uh, my question is with the various stakeholders that you had, and I would imagine that identifying needs and, and progress and challenges are very similar to the budgeting process, but various stakeholders have an opportunity to speak up. How do you balance identifying the needs and priorities um, as they come from teachers, educators, from the administration, and also from the board? Can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, and, and we do have a whole lot of stakeholders. Uh, and, and, and actually, that's a good thing. Uh, if you, you boil it down, what does any parent want in terms of, of, of this zip code, that zip code, this part of town, uh, that part of town? Uh, they want the best we have to offer for their kids. Uh, so that's why it's important to have those conversations, to have those discussions. We, we encourage uh, whether whether it's it's the, the public hearings, whether it's budget time when and, and we go out and done this for years, uh, uh, three uh, public input sessions, uh, purposely in various parts of the district. Uh, uh, but in between that time, we encourage any and everybody, reach out, let us know, so that we can, uh, you know, again, consider it, take a look at it. You're right, we don't have a, a bottomless pit. Uh, one of the fortunate uh, things we have in District 1, and, and, and any school district is going to have, have, have their challenges, um, uh, we, we, we do have the ability to, to put things in place. Uh, we've expanded offerings and opportunities for students from CDL to uh, firefighters to veterinary and so forth and so on. Uh, which may, and, and that came about, well, some of that was grant funding, some, some not. Uh, but but that came about because we did listen. We did seek input. What do we have? And, and the firefighters program came about because uh, talking to Richmond, Richmond County, um, Richmond uh, uh, Columbia Fire. Uh, hey, we, there are no firefighters down that little Richmond area, and, and that area is growing and so forth. In Richmond too, it already had it, I think. Uh, but but we were certainly glad to jump on board. Yes, we we, we will do that. Uh, so what I would encourage, you know, any parent uh, uh, of uh, individuals, reach out, ask us. We do the same thing as, as Dr. David said, whether it's the budget process or, 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 or so forth. We have work sessions uh, uh, with the board uh, that that they can, hey, Mr. Lieutenant, hey, District, can you, can you look at A, B, C, and D? Uh, uh, sure. And we'll take a look at it. And again, sometimes uh, it, it might not be, say, for example, in this year, but it may be in next year again, depending on what 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 happens um, uh, from those various um, um, 
year to year in terms of funding and, 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 and other uh, things from, from the legislature and so forth. Uh, but I would encourage anybody, you know, reach out. You don't have to wait till budget session, uh, budget season, or what have you. Always in budget season. Uh, uh, and then we, we, we'll take a look at it. Now, is it balancing those things? Absolutely. You want to have this? Or can you do this versus, oh, school A, B, and C needs a new rules on the HVAC system. Or look at the rules in the HVAC system, HVAC. But we might get to this, you know, go along with this. So, you know, and that's just a, 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 a capital piece, if you will, uh, how we look at our capital budget. What, what, again, what are those needs? What do we want to take a look at and, and, and so forth? And, and we do plan out some years depending on what those things are. But I would encourage any parent uh, or any stakeholder, hey, let us know. Uh, reach out and let us know. We, we, we're, we're open to that. Dr. Davis, the Senate, I'm getting you to answer that same question. I, I have one last thing kind of wraps in the feedback. Uh, you know, obviously, the Columbia Chamber is a, you know, a made up of the Columbia yeah. businesses, Richard yeah. County businesses. Um, piggybacking on your question about, you know, community input, how can the business community help you in your job? Um, how can they be your ally? Um, uh, on that. Wow, that's a great question. Um, I would say, first and foremost, I would say advocate for public education. Be be the be the partner, be the advocate. Um, and, and and if we don't see eye to eye on something, don't be adversarial. Don't don't make public educators your enemies in the public sphere. I've seen it. I've experienced it. Um, where we get vilified for putting students first. I have an ethical obligation as a superintendent. If you don't believe me, you can pull up the AASA uh, National Superintendent's uh, profile of, uh, for superintendents. I have an, op an ethical obligation to center my decisions around students first. So that's my chief audience, my primary customer, because it's important because it's, it's a delicate balance. You want, and we want the best businesses to city, come to the city of Columbia. We want, we're not just, we want small businesses to thrive, but we also want big business to come to Columbia. The same as Greenville, the same as Charleston. We're competing with them. We want them here. The first thing when I meet with a business leader of a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar corporation, and, and, and I'm gonna say this, remember, Craig and I and J.R. Green and all your superintendents, we are CEOs too. We're not just, we're not junior partners, we're CEOs. I have a $350 million budget, a $468, $486 million um, bond budget that I, and then you, you count up all the buses and the food and everything, it's a billion dollar entity. Treat us like we run a billion dollar entity. Have us have the seat at the table, talk to us, not at us. I'm not being, I'm not being preached, I just, we need you to see us in that light because we make some real hard decisions and we want the best businesses here because we want our students to graduate from our schools and attend our universities and stay in our community and reinvest. I am a dividend of my community. I say this all the time. That's one of the reasons why I stay here in this city. I'm a dividend of my community. And so I reinvest in all the people who invested in me and in my education and now I'm, I'm paying dividends on that investment in me by doing the same for your students, whether they're in Richland 1, Richland 2, or any, any, any school district. So see us as partners and advocate for us because we want to bring those businesses in. But I'll say those CEOs always, they want to know when they bring their families here and relocate, how good are the schools? And if we start saying negative things about our schools, and there's so much negative press about the educational experiences of our school. We can disagree as adults on how things should be, but, but primarily we should be focusing on purpose over preference. And we get caught up in the preference of what we want and not the purpose of what we need. And the purpose of what we need is a premier educational experience for all of our students in this city, in this county. We want businesses to come here. We want them to thrive. We want them to have employees that they don't have to bring and recruit anybody from outside of the Midlands, outside of Richland County to do anything, whether it's technological, whether it's manufacturing, 
whether it's hospitality and tourism, it should not matter. We should be able to produce every student, every employee that any business or corporation needs right here in the middle. But it's going to take us to have a unified effort. And I'll tell you this, the last thing I would say is about that, and I've said this since I've been superintendent, when you bring us in, what's the playbook? What's the agenda? What's my route? What, what play am I supposed to run? So, so we're leaders and somebody's the quarterback, someone's the CEO, someone's the, the, the owner. What's the playbook? Am I the, am I the running back this year? If you give me the ball, let me run the play and block for me. If it's my turn to block for you, let me block for you. But so bring me in and tell me what's the playbook. So talk to us. Talk to us. Not add us and, and stop talking to us through the media. Stop talking to us through the media. Talk to us and, and let us have a conversation and look, not this year, but three or four years out. And I, and I say that with all earnest and sincerity because it's not just about my I want my daughter's children to go to school in, in Columbia. I might not get that with them going all over the place, but, but that's what I want. And so I want to create the best school opportunity. And I think we have the ability to do that. I, I know all of many of you personally, I think we have the ability to do that. But we got to get on the same page and we got to have a plan on how we want to uh, support public education in the school, in this county, so that we can bring those businesses to Richland County and that they will stay. And they'll never say that we can't provide them with the workforce that they need. Thank you both for your, uh, your service to our communities, our, our children. Um, our teachers, uh, you've got a, a hard task, as you pointed out, of being CEOs. So we're very grateful for your time. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for joining. If there's anything the chamber can do for you, please uh, don't ever hesitate to reach out to our staff, Susan and Henry here in the back, as well as Carl. So thanks, everybody, for being here today, and look forward to the next issue school. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.